exactly what Uwe was just saying there, the journey that we now need to go on, we and the planet. Um, I've got a story in the middle which, which relates to the, the land known as Doggerland. If we look directly out through the windows of the building opposite there, there was a time when the North Sea was dry and then it got flooded by climate change. So I got a story about what it was like when that happened in the middle of this one here. Um, I, I brought a couple of objects. I thought that would be appropriate here. This is a piece of Doggerland oak that was dredged up by a fisherman friend from the bottom of the North Sea. It's Paleolithic, probably six, 7,000 years old, that kind of period. It's from the time when the North Sea was dry. And I've got... Um, a Paleolithic um, accent here, which was also dredged up by the same fisherman friend. Um, not off this coast, but further off the coast of Suffolk at the time. So we'll come back and tell a little story in the middle, and then come back at the end of it and say, OK, what, what can we do about it all? Um, uh, then there'll be time for questions, observations, comments before we finish at the end. So that's the, the kind of the plan for, for this little talk. So... Hence, story, saga, and the journey, the heroic journey that, that everyone needs to be making in the face of this kind of very timely issue and problem. Let me kind of set the scene a bit, because Joseph Campbell in 1949, American, I think you'd call him an anthropologist, but a, a psychologist as well, uh, wrote a very famous book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in that, he set the structure for how stories and sagas and folklore kind of emerge and happen, how the journey occurs, and it has echoes with something fundamental about life itself, the phases and stages that we go on as we go through life, but also the, ja the journeys we go on deliberately to walk along the coast or to travel across the sea or to travel somewhere. And, and this was all set in the terms here of the hero's journey, um, the heroic journey, um, which has become very influential. He talked about this being the monomyth. Um, this is the journey, the white, this is, there's only a couple of slides where I've, the white hasn't shown up very well. But this is the hero's journey, where, where you start off in the ordinary world, trouble is brewing, there's a call to adventure, Somebody says you should do something. Gandalf knocks on the door of Frodo's house. Bilbo's house. The journey begins. Um, there's a call to adventure. Then a wise mentor gives advice. You cross a threshold into the special world where something different is happening. There are tests and ordeals and fights and rewards. And just when you think you're making your way back again, there's another bigger challenge. You throw the ring in, in the mine or whatever. And then you come back and you cross the bridge back into ordinary world again and you arrive back and someone says, it's time to do the laundry. You get back and suddenly the world looks different to you but to everybody else the same thing is happening there. So that's the hero's journey. It's the structure of film and it's the structure of novels and it's the structure of our own lives as well. So we find ourselves in a position where, in the ordinary world, trouble is brewing. So here are three tr short transformational journeys. You recognise the context for all of them. Um, Alice falls down a rabbit hole. Magical things happen. The Queen of Hearts says in that, why, sometimes I believe um, uh, before breakfast as many as six impossible things. It's a strange and special world that she falls into. Another kind of story, Cinderella. There are 500 versions of the Cinderella story from across Europe. It's a, it's a widespread, deeply embedded narrative um, about the hopes and wishes and delivery of them, and also a little kind of story that when it was translated into English for the first time from French, the word for fur, for fur slippers, is very similar to ver, which is glass. And it got translated as fur slippers. So in most of those stories, Cinderella is wearing fur slippers, not glass ones. The glass thing. So, so stories develop over time. There's no correct one. There's just the one that we hear 
and then the next one after that, the one that we engage with. Um, and then there's this one, the three bears, Goldilocks, tries the seat, tries the porridge, tries the bed. Um, in many versions it ends well, but perhaps it doesn't as well. Perhaps she gets eaten up by the big bears when she wakes up. So there's all sorts of kind of possibilities for these sorts of transformational journeys, just written in the way that we tell kind of stories about the world. Now we're in this one, the climate crisis. We kind of know what's happening this month in Glasgow. We have hopes, um, but we know that what we're in now is only a 30-year-old really big problem. In 1990, that was when there were 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, actually a safe operating space for humanity. It's a place where we can live quite happily. We'd like to get back to there. It's now 417 parts per million, increasing by two each year. Pandemic didn't really make a lot of difference. So this is happening super fast. We've seen this year record temperatures, the heat dome above the northwest US, the hottest day the world has ever recorded in Death Valley, 56 degrees. I've worked with the indigenous people there where it's been 53, and it's getting seriously hot, but 56 was the hottest day the world has ever recorded. So what is the kind of happening now? And just to give a sense of, well, what's this, what might this look like? We're hoping that we can limit the increase in world temperature to between 1.5 and 2 degrees. This is what they're going to be talking a lot about in Glasgow and then in Egypt next year because we won't achieve what we hope this year. Between 1.5 and 2 would seem to be a kind of good thing to happen. That's what we're hoping for, not more. There are, this is Rakaposhi. There are 46,000 glaciers in the Himalayas stretching from Pamirs and the Hindu Kush in the, in the west right across to the eastern side. And they supply the drinking water for one and a half billion people. At two degrees increased, and we're at plus 1.2 now, at two degrees, 90% of those glaciers disappear. So what disappears is not scenery, lovely view, it is actually a fundamental breakdown of the economy because there's no way that anybody can supply drinking water for free, which is what we get from the glaciers, to one and a half billion people. So before it goes wrong like that, the world economy changes in the same way as it's happened for the pandemic. So that's the sort of shock when people say, oh, well, maybe we can cope with a bit of sea level rise. Well, no, because the economy will fall apart first. So we're at that kind of point, actually. Is it too late? I'm quite optimistic, because if we can act enough in this next 10 years, we'll be all right. And I'm going to finish the talk with some kind of a schedule of possibilities for each of us. I hope that that will give a little bit of hope. But I also want to set the scene for why it's looking kind of problematic. Um, the climate crisis is tied to biodiversity crisis. This is what the Riggs Glacier in Alaska looked like in 1990. This is what it looks like today at the same time of year. And there's lots of pictures like this all over the web, you know, before and after kind of images uh, to, to express the sorts of changes that we've seen over that period, that really short period of time, a single human generation, really. So that leaves us with some thinking about the profile of carbon that's produced by people in different countries and the impact of a kind of seeking of GDP as a way to kind of um, benefit the world. This is the, the carbon footprint per person for 222 countries across the world. It's a log scale, so all the blue ones here are the one and a half billion people who produce less than a tonne per person. The world average is seven tonnes. The UK average, as it happens, is also about seven tonnes. If we could get all of these colours and all of the people there to one tonne, that would actually be a safe place for humanity. So our target for each of us is to do a number of things that reduce our average carbon footprint from seven to one tonne. Six individual projects of a tonne. Coming back to that later on, just hold that thought. One tonne is the target. So 
People living in poor countries need to increase their consumption, not decrease it. So there's an equality argument here going on about the rich need to do more because actually they've caused more of the problem in the first place. They need to reduce their consumption much greater. The the largest production, that right at the top there, um, that top red dot, the, the, the wealthiest countries by income are producing more than 50 tonnes per person. So they've got the most to do. So you can already start to sense it's not the same challenge for everybody. The second part of the story then is that the, the seeking of GDP as a measure of success of economies and success of individuals, us as well, does not map onto happiness and contentment. So pick four countries here. You can do this for just about every affluent or wealthy country across the world. Since 1960, the red dots are the changes in per capita uh, GDP, China, uh, Japan, UK and the US. The green ones are the national data for average happiness of the population in each of the countries. Over 50 years, 60 years nearly actually for the data, average happiness hasn't changed. Despite the fact that we've got lots more stuff We spend more on stuff, we have lots more things, but in spite of all of that, we're about the same as we were back then in terms of happiness and contentment. So there there appears to be a paradox there. It's not the main topic of the talk here, but there are reasons why contentment is taken away whilst we also seek to um, increase GDP. But just to note that there's a breakdown there when thinking about the economy and thinking about what we as individuals want from our lives. So just two examples to explain this a little bit. Um, The first of these is from Japan. The Edo period was a period of incredible economic stability. 1603 to 1868, I should say. Sorry, it's the the white lettering there. Um, A period of great stability and what I call sloth rather than growth. Slow being a good way of living as opposed to the growth bit. And it was a period of of remarkable expansion of pilgrimages, painting, printing, poetry. Haiku poetry emerges in the 1600s from Matsuo uh, Basho, the the statue there. Um, One and a half million people were walking the, the roads and ways of Japan on pilgrimages each year. Temples were established, new festivals 2,000 printing presses in in Kyoto and um, Edo, which is now Tokyo, to help produce the kinds of prints that you see here from Hokusai. So it was a period of of economic stability, but remarkable personal growth and innovation. So some would say this was a failing economy because it didn't have much growth. But others would say, well, hang on a moment, there was quite a lot of interesting stuff going on. This might be in our grasp if we want to think ahead a little bit. If we think over a longer kind of period, in Japan there are still um, some long-standing Shinezi craft shops, crafts and shops, um, that have been established and successful over long periods of time. So there, there's, there's this thing about kind of, well, what do we think of when we think of long periods of time. Do we think of kind of a lifetime or something more than that? Well, this Shinezi shop at the top right here is actually one of ten that's been running for more than a thousand years in the same family. This particular um, operation here, Tanaka Iga, is the 70th generation producing Buddhist artefacts for temples um, established in the 900s in Japan. Same family right through that period. So when you start to see that, you st- I think you start to see the pace of the world in a slightly different way, and we start to value new kinds of things. If, if you can bear to walk to the front, you're welcome to walk to the front. People have just arrived. You don't have to, because everyone will be looking at you. Aren't they? <laughs> so long periods of time. Um, and then other things become important. You probably... Two um, tea cups. Remember the tea ceremony in Japan, the importance of that. 
and deliberately produced, there's a, there's a metal crowd here, deliberately produced to have the smallest of imperfections. Because nobody is seeking to produce perfect things in the world. They're seeking to produce interesting things which remind us about how the world is. So these are both slightly imperfect. They're handmade from Japan. And it tells you something that when the world is not seeking to just produce more stuff and throw it away and more stuff, that we start to value different kinds of, of, of characteristics about the objects that we have in the world. Another example, uh, I've just got the two here. This one from Iceland, a place where stories and sagas are so important. The Iceland sagas are more than a thousand years old, established, you can read them now as they were. Um, about a thousand years ago, at the time, the major time of the sagas emerging, the land Namabok was written, the book of settlements, where every farm was listed. And a thousand years ago in Iceland, there were 4,560 farms, and today there are 4,500. So they've just lost the 60 over that period. In the UK, we've lost millions of farms in just the last 50 years as they've got larger and more competitive and larger. Smaller farmers have disappeared and biodiversity has disappeared from the landscape. Completely different. And because of that length of time, you can go to the very farm in Gisli Saga where he lived and grew up and conflicts emerged. You can go to the very rocks up on the landscape where he fought his final battle and his wife, Ord. Uh, famously um, delivered a killing blow to some of his attackers. You can go to Njal's farm. Njal's was the burnt saga. Fire, flame, climate crisis, all of those things come to mind when you read it. It's still there, the very farm in the landscape. So I think that kind of feels, makes you feel slightly differently about these kind of journeys and what we need to undertake. Um, in the recent times I've been doing some work around what I call the good life. Well what is it then if it isn't GDP and if it isn't some of these other things that we need to be um, we th we're told we need to seek. And I undertook a survey in the last year of, of um, people from across the world 27 countries to try to explore what this term a good life looks like. It's very interesting there are lots of Similar words in different languages, Wen Vivir, Huga, Hao Shanghuo, um, Felicidad, Bonheur, and so forth in other languages that directly translate. You say the good life, and it kind of fits um, uh, for people from within those cultures. And so it's widely used, and I conducted a survey, 2,000 responses, and the interesting thing was that these seven components were the ones that came out really strongly as the common elements of a good life when people were asked, what do you think it is? It's healthy food, togetherness, the social aspects of the world, connected to nature. We're already following the lines of the, of the, um, uh, you know, the things that you mentioned, Uwe, about the school here. Physical activity, personal growth and learning through life, a spiritual, ethical coherence that wraps up the way that we live, and then when we consume stuff, sustainable consumption. Very interestingly, the first six of those, and this we hope as well, are also low carbon. So the thesis here is if we define and think about what we wish to seek with a good life when we set off on the hero's journey, actually the things that we nominate are low consumption. Again, I'll just come back to that towards the end just so you can see how that fits together but we need something to help us on the way so I've been writing a, when talking about stories and sagas about needing tricksters to help us knock us off our kind of stability of where we're standing to get us on the journey to do something different the hare is the big trickster in, in rural England. 70 different names for the hare. And we have all sorts of language like hare-brained to imply something that's kind of, you know, scattered. Um, the mad march hare and so forth. Deeply embedded in culture. The coyote in, in southern and western um, United States is the trickster in almost all stories. Very widely um, uh, uh, represented. And interestingly... 
As we turn and look towards the back, you'll know what's in the window there. Uwe's raven. The raven is the great trickster in the north and western parts of the United States. The raven is the one that, that comes in dreams, that appears, that tricks you into doing things, that steals the sun, steals the moon, behaves in ways that make us think we need to change the way that we do things. So I'm looking for ways to, to trick us into thinking differently about the kind of challenges that we find at the same time. But at the same time, tell stories that, that kind of resonate and help us see the world differently. Um, a wonderful trickster um, is uh, Emily Dickinson, poet. And she said, uh, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Which is a kind of great way of saying, well actually tell the truth, but, but go at it in a slant way. And it's the slant that I want to do now by telling a little story about um, Doggerland. So this is a story called The Drowning of Doggerland. Can you just kind of settle in a bit now? There's a fire burning here. We're sitting around the fire. In the shadows it's flickering. There are maybe ghosts or ravens hovering out there. The children have settled down finally for the evening. Now we've got the story. Here's the story within the story about the people of Doggerland who live out beyond there. I'm going to stand over here for the story within the story to give a different angle on things. And I've called them the Sky People. So this is the saga. I'm just going to kind of read it through, but I'm illustrating it with images as we go through this. It's about 17 or 18 minutes for this story, just to give you an idea of how long it's going to go on for the middle part of my presentation. Then I'm going to come back and wrap things up in, the, in a moment or two. So settle in. If you want to close your eyes and have a little doze, that's fine. But just let the kind of words work on you and see what happens with the story. So this is called The Drowning of Doggerland. It is said the sky people once were numerous for they had drowned, and every dark hide of land and fire pit, each vale and fell, had been seized by the rising flood. The swell of sea had beaten down defence. So they launched their boats, lashed and loaded o'er up skin, and flexed the oars. Among the firs and floops were sobbing infants, fastened tight to strakes of birch. At last ahead appeared a strip of land, they saw a hall upon the cliff. It seemed no spell, no cry to gods by these blue-eyed people who could beat the wind and slip with bow inside the range of creatures on the hunt. It seemed they could not counter how a poison had been cast that sunk their world, their land that fell before the ceaseless tide, as does the oak before the axe. The brine now bore them on toward a beach where figures stood in shadows under sighing pines. The squadron now drew near. The forest people watched this ragged fleet approach. They drew ash bows, for this had been a year of sure attacks and sorrow. So took the strain. Hearn, the king, called to arms, away the anchors, sail round the flanks. Yet Queen Ursa was renowned, her long sight best in tribe. And she now observed, there are babies in those boats. I see no shields arrayed. We should pause and help these people come ashore. After countless battles, Hearn, the fabled hunter, now could see these folk were people fleeing demons. And to elite platoon, he ordered... Stow your bows and lance, but be on guard. Send reserves to ride and help. A tall woman stepped ashore from the leading vessel. Others staggered on the land. Hands pulled the boats through breakers. An infant fell, and Ursa shouted to the rescue party, Watch those children. One was face down in the wash. The boat people scattered 
over sand and dunes, gazed up at mottled sky, muttered thanks to gods of solid land, and drank from skins of water that the forest people proffered, who now could see this was the hour for a rescue, not an echo of the days when flames were lit on seaward ridge and summit to wreck on rocks such passing ships, nor would they need to darken skies, firing arrows at marauders. Sit with us, hailed the green king of wood and swidden from his splendorous hall. Here is roasted meat and honey. Our trees are dense with fruit. Here is draught for all to drink. And the dark-skinned woman, her one eye crimped, stood tall before her people, bowed to king and queen, thanked them for their kindness, said quietly, we have come far, our homes have drowned. And the king motioned, lay your goods on polished floor, you are safe to rest with us. The king paused by his sergeant, send a party to the pines and dig the pits for those bodies lying on the shore. And said to Leda, her name was Sky Rider of the shore. Our people live in marbled woods. We will tell how our children run with deer and elk. How this to us is paradise. And Ursa smiled. When you've fully rested, you must voice the story of your people and this soak. But first we all will walk and give our prayers together for those babies laid in tiny graves. A dream near dawn appeared before the migrant leader. Sky Rider heard a whispered warning. You have endured so much. You must fly up slope, scramble up the cliff. At far Valhalla, Sheer has slid Storiga. Three mountain sides of rock have toppled into Arctic water. At the hour of the hare, the clouds are rosy hue. She dabbed on drops of sea lavender oil and sought the antler king. We all must climb again. Hearn was a wise king and turned to Ursa for her counsel. We should trust this leader. She seems to know most about the water, why the waves have risen, how this curling current has forced them from their camps. So Hearn walked before his woodland people. Pick up your sandals, tie them to your feet, set off uphill. He told Sky Rider and her people, outside our upper hall, let us gather where fragrant blossoms lie upon the roof. The assembled crowd on, on clifftop saw the tide retreat. It did not stop. The sea disclosed an old land and rotted homes, a dry step east to rising sun. Sky Rider unwrapped a beaver skin revealed ancestral bones and ribs of people, let them breathe again. There came cries from children. Some were far below on beach. A distant surf appeared, a grumble from horizon. And now the tidal bore advanced, pouring over sandy flats. This was the sea, yet not the normal sea. Before the wave was billowed cloud of dust, Matter floated in the air. The crowd stood and pointed. They could hear a roar as ocean ran at land. Young men rushed down paths, grabbed up the children. All were scrambling up the sandstone cliff. None had heard such sound, never seen such wall of water. The breaker raced ahead, soon would drown the infants in their mounds. The water tore at amber cliffs, ripped roots from ground, at the base of the cliff, their lower hall was struck yet stood. They could smell the brine, the churning mud. Then all fell silent. The middle sea was... The middle land was shallow sea. Dogger land was, ba was bank and swale, where once the horse had run. Sighed the oaken king, light the fire pits, bring food and vintage mead. He called on sky, we hope plain words will help us apprehend this mess. Sky Rider stood with staff that fit so well her grasp, a shield of four-fold hide slung upon her back. The birds of shore had flown, yet above them larks were singing. Hearn cried to her to servants, fetch more logs, stoke the blaze, 
come forward out of shadows. Sky saw the hunting dogs were wagging tails, running through the crowd. She saw the sea had calmed. It seemed they now were safe, even as the waters lapped at cliff. A tale commenced. You will recall it had been fearsome cold, thunder chilled this far south. We the people padded north, mammoth numbers poorer. On hunting hill and grassy plain, on Doggerland we camped at salty marsh and wide lagoon by a million whistling waders. And at the still point, lovely ash Yggdrasil propped up the sky and serpent circled brine, the guard of all our ground. In those distant days, Dogger was a wide, dry plain. You can see we are dark-skinned stalkers and were chasers of the horse, the hackneys and their mares, the broad-browed auroch, great bison herds, and harried by our dogs were giant elk and reindeer. We fished for shell, fixed barb of antler bone. For a thousand summers, ten hundred more, we hunted Tunnel Valley, roamed the commons, sharpened every spear point, chanted song and story. Even as we hunter-gatherers shaped the ground by sowing fruit and seed harboured from the wild, where neither was there corn nor docile beast, we could not hope for any better place. Yet we later learned of creeping shift, icebergs set free. Though eagles playing serene above the stormy shore, the waves we begged to wait would bring a great betrayal. The seas were rising up. We sensed a warp of salt and sand. Let me tell of my grandmother, flyer of our tribes. Sky runner of the steppe was wiry, her skin was scorched, and wearing amber brooch, loose limbed she led the clan through rippled grass around the lakes. They sang by fire pit, flickering by the, campus, the canvas camps. At the ends of ropes, the children spun their flutes of bone. It was the sound of prairie wind. It called our roaming herds. We tossed our laughing infants in the air, never wearied of the ways. Every place to us was protected by a spirit guard, each spring and cave a link between the inner outer worlds. We always paused to pay respects and place an offering when lancing from a cloud, light rays shone on grass so lush. It might rain for days, the dry gulch flooded. In a drought we called on clouds and stamped to rain dance song till the rose of dawn. Our tents were warm, though in winter grey hair comes to us all. The air was life, a wealth of sun and rain, yet also fetched our greatest fear, green funnel clouds. Yet as the gannet screamed, a storm was beating at our, sh at our home. My mother was a shaman too, and travelled far in dreams. She checked the tides, watched them sink a salt marsh, and heard the tales, strange from southern marches, where had herders settled, and carried soil in baskets, and by some magic trained their cattle into passive herds. Still we dogger people cheered, and honed the sharper blade, battled bear and browser. It had always been that way. Yet flighting in came a flock of snowy herons, each with a crest of feathers standing tall upon the mirrored marsh. Now waves were rising, the height of me in half a hundred years. So in and up we carried camps where elders warbled their lovely lullabies, so washed the rising waves, the currents lapping at our gate. We were not alarmed, just now shifted often. We skies had always trekked, but roots grew shorter. Our world was shrinking as we stirred some ochre with water drawn from sacred spring and a holy cave on scarp. We all were taught to hold a palm upon the sacred rock and blow a fine red dust. So by auroch hands were painted arrows in a roaming horse. We wanted each to have the spirit of a summer evening cloud. I was a little taller than my mother, 
and I sang before our yurts, we had to hurry, dig up a hundred holy graves, bury bones once more, lay the bow of ash, bury beside the red deer skull, set antler harpoon with the axe. Yet one day, braiding baskets, a willow withy speared me in this eye, its liquid life drained out, my sight now halved. I called on Odin, desist and stop the sea. Still the surge poured in, league on league, not letting up. Gulls seethed about the shore. The sooty petrel plunged, cold cried the cormorant. I knew it was another sign. We could not tame this tempest. All our shamans tried. Had we eaten fish forbidden? Had a snake whispered in the grass? No one could tell. It seemed we had been fastened inside a frightful spell, and one sharp dawn came a shocking sight. The sun star rose from water, later slipped into the western waves. I, I dreamed our world would drown, yet one tribal clan refused to see. They stood and shouted, why us, why ever us, we'll not dig another bone. They said it had been shamans who had brought disaster on them all. She gazed around at the audience with her eye, and the king and queen nodded, for they too had seen how people at their camp started with complaints when their stable worlds seemed to snap apart. So sky commenced. When the night lion roars, your senses sharpen, for this was Growler grabbing land. Our ground had shrunk, a lean breach at first, and in came spacious, yeasty sea. Grain and yard were lost. We searched above for signs in hoops of moon and sun, sat trembling in the, in the sweat lodge, red and raw, each glowing stone. Watched cloud and soul burn. Counted days, both long and short. Saw fire streak across the starlit sky. I called my four scout boys. Fetched the rangy dogs. Those lads were nappers. Experts of the flint, they could split a stone, find the blade inside. So, I, so their feet would hardly touch the rippling grass below. They mapped the land, measured shore beside the rain. And at the camp they sang our whistling, beating music of the steppe. But that clan of hostile vipers crept and pounced one night, and three were slain, their bodies thrown in mere. Lane Deer was the youngest boy. He folded into shadows. Fast across the step, he raced to bring the news. We were surrounded. It was a wet world now. I called on tribal carvers, gathered teeth and tusk, grooved the faces of the boys, each beside a stag. Now we had to fish for wrasse, safe and long ling too. We returned to salt, wealth and oyster shell. Our people had been crushed and Dogger Isle was disappearing. We assembled plant and potion, brewed broth of sage, sipped soup from ladles, but still the fissured oak on lower land settled into rising bog and soon were embraced, heavy on the seabed. We ranged from wet to higher land, hauling boats of hide. We did not want the gold that had been dug from graves. We craved the ground. It seemed we failed this test of gods, so embarked upon this trail of tears. Silence followed story. Sky's tale was near complete. Gripped by spell of words, the forest people then applauded, tapping hilts of knife on hollow blocks of wood, she had filled their sinews with every kind of sorrow. So the people on the cliff top passed from hand to hand more horns of mead and turned the spits of meat that soon would fully roast and reclined in humming meadow, building back the tales about the flooded people of the, of the plain. At last Hearn stretched his tendons. True wealth is not gold abandoned in your graves and ground. It is our sons and daughters. It is the land secure and safe beneath our feet. But then he stepped up and said, So why did the sea rise? 
and will it ever stop? And now Skyrider opened hands and shrugged in silence. So he called on heralds, blow on trumpet shells, for now you skies are safe. We all can see you have suffered more than most. Skyrider replied, your generosity to strangers is a bond, so I will tell you of another way to raise your plants and beasts. She said of lame deer, he will fetch our sheep and harmless cow and gentle woodland pig. A trader from the lands of thirst came from far away to south. Gilgamesh, the merchant, showed us how. Select the quiet members of the herd, we, and so we raised them in a buyer by our tented camp. She gave to Hearn, the hunter, a tight-sewn leather bag. Here are seeds of grass, good-sized and golden. Clear the clods, sow them after winter. And these two bright ewes, they each will birth in spring, two leaping lambs apiece. And the oaken people were impressed. Yet she warned one pale-faced trader, sneezed a killing kind of ache. She had mixed more herbs, yet many of their band of wind rattled lungs and died. Hearn cut the seeds, rose to his feet. How awful when the wealth of worlds is laid to waste, when hall and tent are rime encrusted, when waves will rack our bones. This is reminder to us all our own chill winter's fast approach. I see the fire splutters, the children deep in dream. We will heed and set a sentry, Hope we have the ear of forest gods. From their camp was silence. Not a fly was buzzing. A cuckoo called three times and settled on a nearby branch. Hearn declared his plan, his plan. We will take you to the land of cloud where the ground is white and stable. The time for grief is gone. You can mark each place, mend the moon and heal the land. You can see our magi dye their skin with woad, the blue to dissipate the sea. Yet now perhaps will come an age of digging stone. We will guide you all, go along the wildest roads beyond the bear and deer. You can settle on the, on the hills of chalk. Well, perhaps one day their new camps and capital will rise on rolling downs away toward the settling sun. Far below them will be woods and meadows blooming to horizon, and they will sleep without a troubling dream. For that sea did stop, yet even as they prayed, it had been death to cries, their homes long flushed with salt. Can you imagine? Herring now have followed, and they will swim far across the novel northern sea. That's called The Drowning of Doggerland. Let me just kind of put some more wood on the fire, let it blaze up a little bit. Let me just bring you back in then. From the east coast now, the sun rises on the morning of the solstice, the longest day of the year. And we look out towards the sea, and this was, as, uh, as I've said, this was Doggerland some thousand years ago. So journeys lie ahead for us. They always do. The good life, as I've said earlier, is low carbon and high in happiness. It's high in nature, high in happiness. And personal growth, doing things, trying stuff, inventing things, being with others, is also high in happiness. So if we find a way to set off on this journey and seek and define the good life, a good life, because there are many, one for each of us awaits, then we might also start to address the climate crisis. Uh, three examples. I'm sure it looks like this on the beach here. On certain days of the year. This is from across the water in Essex. On such a day, what are people doing? They're doing nothing. They're sitting around doing nothing, walking around, looking at the sky, looking at the mud, 
doing nothing. You don't let yourself do nothing when you're at home. You have a list. You have too many things to do. Our lives are driven by busyness often. And yet doing nothing, settling into the land. This is one of the reasons why the beach has become so iconic. The idea of a holiday, a break, an escape at the beach, which was indeed um, why Margate and other coastal towns grew in the first place. Do you have such a picture on your phone or on your camera somewhere? Do you have a picture of a sunset? What happens when we see a sunset? Is there something innate in this lovely colour? This is a picture. That's South End Pier, actually. I think South End has never looked so gorgeous as on this day when I flew over it with a farmer friend. Um, What happens when you see a sunset like this? And you, Well, all it is is a learnt behaviour. Because when it happens, you look at the colours and you think, whoa, that lovely. And then you say to someone else, come, come and look at the sun. You know, oh, fantastic, isn't it? And you have a moment's calm, a kind of meditative moment, where we stop being anxious about all the things that, that are stressing us about life itself, and we just kind of settle into the land for a moment or two, and then take a picture. We might listen to bird song or look at the birds When we do this and do the previous things, you could say we are consuming nature in some sort of way because it's a thing that's happening to us. But the interesting thing is that when we have consumed the bird song, the birds are still there afterwards. We haven't used them up. So the consumption of resources on the planet in the kind of modern era has meant using up stuff Whereas actually the things that tend to make us happy and contented and connected, they're still there after we've engaged with them. So let me just run through. This is what I call a carbon schedule. And this is some of the research that we've been doing to look at the individual options in front of each of us to get from seven to one ton. Now, there are 30 different things here. I'm going to do food and energy and transport and stuff and things um, on, on separate slides. The, the principle that underpins this is you choose one thing that you think you can do, do it for a while, and then choose another one next year. Because if we do that between now and 2030, we will get from seven tonnes to one tonne for each of us. The job will be done. So it's a model that's not the same. This is, this is uh, not plat de jour, where you all have to do the same thing. It's a menu that gives you options and choices. And some of these choices mean spending resource, and some don't. So if we take food, first of all, plant-based diets, eating sustainable and organic, and local food offer substantial options. A vegetarian diet... It's about 0.7 of a tonne per year compared with the average diet in the country. Vegan, slightly more. If you can't do that and go for two meat three days a week, 0.2 of a tonne. Local food, half a tonne. Sustainable and organic, uh, a tonne. So there are some options around food that give you the choices that we could be making in order to move from that seven to one. Energy and the home. Well, some of these involve spending money. You'll have heard quite a lot this week about, about um, air source heat pumps. Probably about a ton and a half for each of us if we could install them, but it's going to cost a lot of money. Putting solar panels on the roof. Well, between one, and one to one and a half tons, depending on how many you can put there. Payback time, six, seven years, something like that. But you've still got to spend the money to put them in place. We've got them at home. I don't pay any electricity bills because the solar panels, having put them in, have been producing enough energy for us for the last 14 years. Um, And so, in a sense, you could say, well, I've already done that, and the average is seven tonnes per person, so that option isn't in front of me. I can't really bank that. I've got to do something different to contribute from now in 2021 to getting to one tonne. The big ticket item here is switching electricity to only renewables. Um, uh, That's the really successful one. That's a 1.6 tonne straight away, getting it in place. 
Um, that's the one I would say to everybody, try to do. Make sure it really is a green tariff and not one of these pretend ones from, from the big companies. Um, transport, well, a couple of big options. Electric vehicles, about two tonnes if you get rid of your car. We're all going to have to do that if you drive by 2030 anyway, so it's coming. Um, but car-free, same, two tonnes. Um, active transport, tonne and a half if you cycle, walk and use public transport. Um, flying, though, just wrecks a hole in the whole lot, as you probably all know. Um, it varies one return flight from London to New York. In a sense, this should be this side of the, of the graph, but it doesn't show so well. But one flight from London to New York is going <coughs> to cost about two tonnes for each person. So you can do all of those good things and then wreck it with flights. We're probably not going to see a technological option for flights for 15 years, probably, before they get renewable fuels into aeroplanes. So they're going to be a problem for quite a while. And other things. Well, there's a... There's the, it's actually, there's, a, there's an error here. I should say 30 times movement. There's a wonderful wear it 30 times movement for clothing to encourage people not to buy stuff and just wear it once and then buy another one. It's to wear things 30 times to reduce our kind of net consumption. Um, and as we move towards some of these other areas, we start to see that there are dilemmas in thinking only about carbon. Uh, it's not the only measure. So, for example, um, a pet costs you about a tonne per year. But you might think, well, you know what, I get a lot of other benefits from having a pet. And so what I need to do is something different on the carbon schedule to set off that one tonne of the pet. Um, uh, plastic use, really good use reasons for reducing plastic use, doesn't play out large when it comes to the carbon footprint. It's tiny, really. 0.1 to 0.2 of a tonne, really not enough. So it's good to do for other reasons, but when it comes to the carbon bit, we've got other priorities. Planting trees, wonderful. Plant lots of trees, but if we plant 10 of these oak trees from my garden, then it takes 10 years to save one tonne. Too slow. It's great to plant trees, wonderful for biodiversity, good to have more forests, lots of good reasons but they're not, going to, they're not going to act quickly enough for us. The crisis is upon us more readily. So it's going to be consumption. We should still plant trees, but they're not going to be our solution. It was in the press this week, as you will have heard. So good reasons for doing it, but it's not going to save us when it comes to the climate crisis. So this is, this is what I call the carbon schedule. I present it in this way just to make the point we've got choices. If you could pick one, you're setting off on the journey. You're going from ordinary world to special world and there will be crises, there'll be dragons and there'll be ogres and trolls trying to stop you doing it but you've got to kind of, we've all, each of us got to find ways to do that and then tell other people. So I've got, in, this is my finishing set of slides with a couple of quotes in a moment, some trickster questions to ask you about thinking about being highly attentive to what's around us in the world and does that attentiveness change the way that we think about things and make those transitions easier? So I call these trickster questions. What's the route of rainfall to your tap? Do you know what it is? I don't know what it is here. But where, where, does, the, where does the water in your tap come from? Yeah, exactly where. How long does it take to get there? You know, I'm not asking for an answer, as it were, but I'm just asking, do you know what it is, and do we understand that? Um, how many days till the moon is full? Exactly. Because <laughs> a full moon last night, fantastic. You probably had some nice, nice images here. But a question about that. Can you name five trees nearest your home? From where you are reading this, which way is north? It's kind of easy, isn't it? because we're sitting next to the stackway, isn't it? Yeah. I think I've got that right. Somebody at the back is giving me a little hint. Thank you. Um, how many people live next door to you, and do you know their names? And this is a question for older people. It's a really interesting one, because it breaks into two camps. What have you learned from your children? Some people say, not a sausage. 
you know, to be in, I wouldn't learn from them. And other people say, well, of course, lots of things. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of worldview, actually, about the world, um, about whether people learn from others or whether they think they have the answers. And the final one for you, so far, what were the best times in your life? And I've used this in the broadest sense. What were the things that you would say are the best things, best moments, the best times in your life? And two quotes for you to, to just secure this from the Tao Te Ching and from Mary Oliver, the great American poet. She died two years ago in her 80s. Tao Te Ching was written 2,500 years ago. Chapter 33 says this. It says, the best things in life and not things. So they, across human history, we've been thinking about this sort of stuff lots of times in lots of places. It's not particularly new. It's very pressing at this particular time. But I suspect that if you answer that question about that final trickster question, what were the best times, moments, things, they probably weren't acquiring a thing. I guess is that's the case. Um, and Mary Oliver said this in her wonderful seven-word poem, Instructions for Living a Life. Pay attention, be astonished, and then tell about it. And I think that final bit is the lesson for all of this. I hope the sun will set, will come down across the land. Opportunities are there for us to tell about it and to influence others. And that's really, in a sense, what... I'm trying to do by thinking about telling tales and stories about the land and about the sea. And the sea sagas, where I read that piece just now, will be in a book that appears next year, next spring, hopefully. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks.